All right, before we get started, I want to start with a little Dungeons and Dragons joke. Okay, you guys ready? Here's the joke. Fourth edition. Ha. So, let's get a few things straight. Wizards of the Coast basically sucks. I like the fact that Magic the Gathering things are now in D&D, but basically everything else they're doing sucks. And Dungeons and Dragons and its modern incarnation is a huge, huge contribution to the homogenization of fantasy as a genre, which is in itself antithetical to fantasy as a genre. So let's just say that I had low expectations when I went into this. I didn't even actually pay money for this. I actually got to see the movie for free because of passes that I was given because I regularly donate blood. By the way, you should totally donate blood if you can. It's a good thing to do, and sometimes you get little perks like that, and also it saves lives. That's a really good thing. You should totally do it if you can. But to begin with, the movie looks great. A lot of care was put into the costumes, the sets, and the animatronics. There's a dragonborn really early in the film, and the head prop looks fantastic. I think they reuse it later for another character, but I can't prove that. I've only seen the film once, so yeah. Also, the movie starts with violence aimed at Arakakra, so you know it has to be good. If you don't get what I'm talking about, you need to go watch the Tabletop Chi Bros videos and you'll understand. The soundtrack in the movie is good, and it's rather non-invasive. The highlight song of the OST is actually a song that two of the main characters sing together to show their camaraderie, and I think that works to the film's credit. So, let's get into the story now. The story follows Edgen, who's a bard who for once isn't perfect at everything or trying to seduce anything that moves. Seriously, D&D players, it's time to find the new shtick for bards. He actually has a moral character and explains that he only became a thief due to his joining an organization called the Harbors, which involves serving the community even if it meant sacrifice of the self. After his wife died, he gave up on his oath and tried to raise his daughter Kira with his sworn sister Holga, the party barbarian. Maybe fighter. Not sure. Kind of hard to tell. Along the way, they recruit Simon, a so-called so-so sorcerer, and Doric, a tiefling druid. It's a little conspicuous that the women of the party are hyper-competent in their specializations, and I did worry that this might have been going the way of modern Wizards of the Coast, but as the movie went on, I was pleasantly surprised to find that wasn't the case. Basically, every core cast member gets funny moments and serious ones, and it's balanced relatively well with a strong bias towards the comedy aspect of the action-comedy genre. Towards the end, there's even some warmth and character growth, which I feel a lot of modern cinema is in dire need of just more of that. I wish there was more of it, and I find myself saying this a lot recently. I want character warmth and depth. I want characters to reflect on their failings and find hope in the growth of their journey. I want them to find that series of events that lead them to a sense of camaraderie and and one-upmanship and self-betterment. And while this movie dips its toes in that kind of water, it still hesitates to dive straight in. And this is where I have my biggest critique of the film. And the biggest elephant in the room with the film is that this movie is trying really, really, really hard to be Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, if you're going to steal, steal from quality, but still, I hate what Marvel has done to modern cinema. Everyone's afraid of deviating from the Marvel formula because they just want to make a lot of money. The only thing that D&D does not do in that respect is the obligatory sequel baiting. The film is left open for a possible sequel, but there's no and then X character shows up and the crowd all clapped moment. But it's very clear that they are trying to pattern themselves after the Marvel formula, and while they do a good job with it on the whole, I do wish there was less of it. A lot of the character dialogue does tend to trend towards that Marvel quip, quippy, quip kind of character dialogue, which can be fine in small doses. But you guys know that not every Marvel movie did that, right? Does every modern cinematic experience that wants to make money just want to be Iron Man that badly? It's a little distracting at times, though. On the whole, I was actually kind of pleased to see how these characters interacted. Edgen in particular has a lot of character, and probably the one who really carries the film a lot, because the other characters are following his lead. By his own admission, he's the plan guy. He makes plans. And honestly, Chris Pine is obviously having a lot of fun in the role, so I'm glad that he got to be that that big on-screen presence that he was throughout most of the film. 
a friend of mine complained that he doesn't end up casting any spells throughout the movie, and that's really where it kind of set in. I'm like, he really is just the Star Lord. He just kind of has his weapons, and that's it. He he doesn't really have a more magic centric role since that's pretty much dominated by the druid and the sorcerer instead. And Holga does all the heavy lifting physically pretty much up until the film's climax, which is really good, but it's really clear that the separation of abilities was very deliberate and again, very, very heavily cribbing from Guardians of the Galaxy, which again has good sides and downsides. And it honestly leaves me a little conflicted in the end because that's frustrating. But the movie on its own in a vacuum is still really, really good. And longtime fans have a lot to look forward to. There's a lot of references to things that are well known. They talk about uh, Beholders, for instance. They mention Baldur's Gate. They mention Neverwinter. There's an owlbear that shows up. So that's pretty cool. Stuff like that. There's clearly some level of fan passion found in the film. And there was clearly a large push to at least make it look and feel like Dungeons and Dragons, even if the story itself is just okay. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and ask my good buddy Cog to drop the spoiler warning right about here-ish. Warning. It is a non-stop spoiler onslaught going forward. Abandon all pretenses. You enter here. Thank you. So, you see, the thing with the story, and this is also one of those things that bugged me throughout, is they explain the story basically to the point where everyone in the audience should be like, oh, okay, so that's what's happening. And the heroes don't get it. (laughs) The entire story revolves around them being betrayed by their associate, uh, Forge. And he ends up becoming the new lord of Neverwinter due to a long, long series of backstabbings. And he ends up basically forcibly kidnapping slash adopting Kira, Edgin's daughter. And they're basically on a mission to get her back and the treasure that they rightfully stole that was stolen from them, and they're going to steal it back. So that's all well and good until they meet a paladin about halfway into the film, and I actually really like the way they characterized him because he's this very stern by-the-book fellow, but he doesn't understand metaphor or like colloquialisms, and he's really, really, really funny because of that. I actually really, really like that about his character. So... He shows up and explains to them, oh, there are these red wizards and they're this occult organization that basically works for a demon lord and they are looking to just kill people by the biggest numbers possible to create an undead army and rule the world like you do. And the heroes never put together what's happening until the red wizard is channeling the exact same spell the paladin warned them about like 30 minutes before. (laughs) It's like, Guys, the, the D&D party being dense to the GM's designs is indeed indicative that this is set in D&D, but holy crap, they literally spelled it out for you. There is no reason you shouldn't have known what was going on. So that was a little bit frustrating, but overall, the movie is paced well, even though the movie is a solid two-hour block. The movie is very fast-paced, and there's a lot of really funny bits. My personal favorite, and I wanted to save this for the spoilers for obvious reasons, but there's a bit where it turns out the sorcerer has this trinket that can revive the dead, and you can ask them five questions before they return to being dead. And they'll have this, they have this huge Abbott and Costello routine in the middle of this battlefield. <laughs> and it is one of the genuine funniest moments of the entire film, and it shows a lot of creative energy and a lot of really intuitive and original ideas were put into place for the film. So I liked that a lot. So in summation, the movie is a solid B. It is a good movie, much better than I expected, though I went in with very low expectations, to be fair. And if Wizards of the Coast try to clean up their act and stay at about this level of quality going forward, well, I'd be surprised if we're being honest, <laughs> but um, I'd welcome it. I would not turn that away kind of thing. But honestly, like I said, The recent trajectory has been downward, and I think this is probably, at best, a fluke. Now, would I welcome more? Yes. I would watch a sequel to this, or maybe something set in the same world, but with new characters, for instance. This could very easily become an anthology series. 
So my recommendation is see it when you can see it on a matinee or pick it up cheap when the DVD drops. So this has been the Hipster Snack, and thanks for joining me on this relatively quick update to Snackflix. And uh, if you like Dungeons & Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, let me know what you thought in the comments. And join me here each week for more like this with game reviews, deck tech, the new home of the Tomodachi Bros podcast, and more. And I'll see you next time.